Good afternoon and welcome to this month's Altitude, Nats's monthly live stream. My name is Fran Slater, I'm an air traffic controller here at Nats and I'm really delighted to be back hosting the show for you this month. Now, despite the weather at the weekend, it was still really wonderful to see the fly past over Buckingham Palace to mark the King's coronation. A huge amount of planning and preparation goes into days like Saturday and indeed to previous fly pasts like the one for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee and the 100th anniversary of the RAF. But what does it really take to organise something like this in what is some of the world's busiest airspace? So to help tell you that story, I'm really thrilled today to be joined by two very special guests from the Royal Air Force, Wing Commander Noel Rees, who was the fly past mission commander on Saturday, and 78 Squadron Air Traffic Controller and Supervisor Warrant Officer Nikki Epps. Hello to Noel and Nikki. Hello. Hi. Uh, and I'm also really thrilled to be joined by my Nats colleague, Richard Taylor. Rich was part of the fly past project team in Nats and had responsibility for all the civil air traffic elements. And we'll talk about what that means as we go through the day. Hello to you, Rich. Hi, Fran. So before we get started, remember that you can submit questions to us, uh, that any questions that you have as we go along or anything you've thought of beforehand, we'll do our very best to get to those, to answering those as many as we can at the end of the show today. Uh, so let's start off. Uh, Noel, let's talk to you first of all. Tell me who you are and what you do and what you had to do on Saturday. So I'm Wing Commander Noel Rees. Uh, I'm, my day job is Officer Commanding 6 Squadron, which is a Typhoon Squadron based up at RA Glossymouth. Uh, and on Saturday, I was the Mission Commander for the coronation fly past. So that role is effectively uh, responsible for all the planning and execution, uh, safe execution of the fly past itself. So it's about a three month lead in uh, to, to the day itself. Brilliant, thank you. Nikki, tell me about you and what you do and what you did on Saturday. Yeah, so I'm a warrant officer Nikki Epps. I work at 78 Squadron at Swanwick. I'm a air traffic controller and, as you said, a supervisor as well. Um, but on Saturday, um, myself and my colleague, Flight Lieutenant Nat Brealy, we were the fly pass coordinators for 78 Squadron for the Coronation Fly Past. Thank you. And Rich, tell me about yourself and what you do and what you were involved with Saturday. Yeah, of course. So I'm I'm one of the operations supervisors, uh, leading and managing one of the the watches that look after the airspace over London and South East England from a from a civil air traffic perspective, uh, with with respect to to this fly past. So I've been on point for pulling together a, a, a wide team of experts really within Nats. I can't can't really take all the credit. Um, pulling together the procedures teams, um, making sure we got the right the right people in the right places to help facilitate the fly past on Saturday afternoon. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So I think, first of all, a big congratulations to everyone, because I think we did a great job. <laughs> um, but we know it wasn't really quite how we'd hoped, quite what we'd planned for the weekend. Um, I hope there wasn't too much disappointment around either in the public or, or indeed with all the people who've been planning it. So, Noel, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about the decision making and, and how you took the decision to limit the number of aircraft that were in the fly past on Saturday. So from when the uh, fly past preparations get pulled together. We obviously come up with various different contingencies for for weather and effectively there there are four four different options. There's you know the full version, the limited version, a very limited version, and then none, no fly past at all. So the sort of the decision making and, and the process leading up to that sort of started three months ago as we as we started to build together what the different weather options could be. Um, so pretty much on the the day leading up to it, uh, we had a meteor meteorological brief the day before um, from the sort of central Met office um, and then leading on to the morning of itself where we got together with the senior responsible officer, the two star um, RAF officer who was in charge of the sort of the decision making for that. And we got together in the morning and effectively went through the options at that point um, because obviously we wanted to deliver the spectacle. We wanted to deliver the 68 aircraft, the full the full version. Um, the decision was made to to launch the aircraft um, to the holds um, with the hope that we could um, still uh, generate uh, either the full or the limited. Um, the decision itself um, actually comes 45 minutes before once we've got those final weather checks from some of the helicopters that we've got in the area, both um, helicopters from uh, the military, but also civilian helicopters as well, including the police helicopter. They're giving us all the weather reports that gets fed into the senior decision maker, and then that's communicated to me on the aircraft to then enact whichever option uh, we came out with. And as I say, unfortunately, it was one of the more limited options on Saturday, but that decision was taken for safety and in accordance with the regulations that we must stick to uh, when we're planning these sorts of fly paths. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I know you mentioned in your introduction, you said it was about three months, but, you know, how does planning start for something like this and how long ago did that start? So the the actual sort of detailed, if you imagine that that sort of concept of our parade of aircraft starts probably about about six months before. And that's down to what do we want to see? What do we want to uh, put together for His Majesty the King? So once we've got that concept, when we sort of put that together, it was around about three months before we started to look at, right, here's the concept. Uh, how do we turn this into reality and how do we uh, how do we put all the different aircraft of various different capabilities, speeds? How do we put them all together? Uh, and effectively, it's that sort of order that um, that you see quite regularly replicated with the slower aircraft at the front and the faster aircraft at the back. That sort of is replicated um, each year that we do these. Um, and from there, we start building the actual drawing of the route, um, planning of the different heights, uh, as well as the speeds, the headings and everything in, in accordance with um, the airspace that we've got to work with. So, Rich, then from a civilian point of view, how does the planning go from there? Is that a similar time scale or? Broadly speaking, Fran, yes, it was, I think. Um, so uh, a lot of the, a lot of the early work was done with our procedures team in, in liaison with our military colleagues. Um, uh, we touched on at the start that we've we've had the, the RAF 100 and, and Jubilee fly pass in, in the not too distance distant pasts. So there's there's a framework to build on there really from previously successful fly pasts. Obviously, different different display elements, different aircraft um, factor into that, and and, and there needs to be adjustments made. And uh, as Noel as Noel touched on, then as well, some of those those procedures that we start working on, maybe three months out or whatever, uh, kind of kind of involve making sure that we we can minimise the impact of civil air traffic. So obviously, there's a, there's a there's a lot of a lot of very busy airports around the London area. Um, and there's, there's, there's without having significant impact, there's a limited number of ways in and out um, to get to get aircraft in, in formation, past the major airfields, that, you know, down the, down the mile over the palace, and then and then safely exit the other side as well. Um, so that that process starts a, a few months out when we're made aware that, that the fly pass was part of the coronation celebrations. Uh, in terms of in terms of resource as well, making sure that we have the right people in the right place. You're looking at about about six weeks. And then inevitably, you know, you get the, the 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 weather scenario. Maybe maybe starts to develop two to two to one weeks out, uh, and we start having um, frequent conversations on the on the run up to the day around contingency planning and what what may or may not happen, and, and, and basically basically to try and re remove as many uncertainties as possible going into the day itself. Yeah. And Nikki, what about you from an operational sort of RAF controlling point of view? How much prep do you have to do as well? We're involved um, in the in the meetings for the planning right from the start, so we know exactly how ma how many aircraft are going to be going. And um, mainly for us, because it's based on timings, and the aircraft will know when they need to move and when they need to push to a different point. Mainly for the controllers at um, 78 Squadron, it's it, it, we focus our attention on the egress mainly when they've passed Buckingham Palace, because then they're all under our control and we all have to get them home safely as you know as quickly as possible as we can to allow the civilians to get the airspace back and for Heathrow operations to start again. So, um, Noel, tell me how you co go about coordinating getting all the aircraft involved to be in the right places at the right time from literally where they're starting from to, to getting them ready to, to be flying on the fly past day. So from the initial planning meeting that we did actually face to face uh, where we come up with the I'll say that the structure of exactly who's going to go when and what order. And um, once we've got that, we know the speeds they're flying and we've decided what the times are between each of the elements. Um, from there, you effectively draw our route back to the holding areas. Now, for the larger aircraft, the majority of the holding areas are over in the North Sea. Uh, gives us a bit more freedom of manoeuvre in terms of heights, uh, but also gives a, a long run in uh, to be able to refine the formation down and also refine the timing between the elements. So you imagine it as a large concertina that sort of starts off very, very large and then compresses down to the ideal over the palace in terms of the um, number of seconds between each element um, going over the palace itself. So once you've drawn that all out, we use a planning tool uh, in the RAF to do that. Uh, and that's something we use day to day for all our normal operational uh, and exercise flying. Um, once we've planned all those speeds, times and all the routes, then it starts to become this sort of uh, map full of lines of spaghetti. <laughs> and as Nikki said, the, the biggest challenge there is with this large concertina that's being squashed down is that you don't really, uh, because of the slower aircraft at the front, 
And what you can't do is then um, concentrate it back the other way um, because everyone's still compressing. So the only way to solve it now is to fan everybody out and to be able to use it laterally uh, and use all the different routes that we planned. Um, so that was what really took the time is to make sure that we can safely get those aircraft which might be traveling at 300 knots um, over the ground um, compared with at the front the helicopters which are doing 90 knots and so we do need a lot of lateral space because what we don't have is vertical space um, with the controlled airspace above us so that's the sort of um, that's what takes quite a lot of time and we go through lots of different iteration, iterations of the plan um, through the first planning meeting into a sort of secondary follow-up and then into the sort of final planning meeting so there's about four planning sessions overall to get to sort of the final um, the final um, just, you know the final solution that we did uh, in terms of the timings and the headings the frequencies which is where sort of Nikki and her team of experts all come in in terms of exactly who needs to go to what frequency and then liaising with all the other different agencies as well. Yeah, so that's in interesting with all the different types of aircraft. So obviously you've got some vintage aircraft that fly very slowly and helicopters that fly relatively slowly and then obviously some much faster aircraft. So Nikki, what are the practical difficulties in managing that sort of big set of different aircraft when they're, you know, anything between 80 and 100 years different in age? I think I'll probably have to pass that one over to Noel. He knows much more about that than me. <laughs> So, so, so some of the issues that we find are initially down at the communications is, is what radios everyone has. Um, so some aircraft only have uh, VHF radios, some aircraft have um, a mixture. Um, so when we come up with the comms plan, communication plan, we have to sort of cater for all those different aircraft to make sure that we can send an aircraft from one frequency to another um, and they've definitely got enough boxes in the aeroplane to be able to do that so obviously the larger larger aircraft um, so the p8 that i was on doing the sort of more command and control we had around about six different radios and i was listening to about four of them at any one time so those sort of platforms don't really have a problem with it it's the smaller aircraft that do um, in terms of the in terms of the speed that uh, everyone's going, um, everyone's at the same height. Um, that's sort of set by the regulations. Um, so it really is just a case of managing how quickly aircraft are going to catch up with the aircraft ahead. Um, so what we have to do is just consider that someone who's going 90 knots, the rotary assets at the front, um, they have to effectively laterally get out of the way and turn. Um, so when they do that, that's sort of where we have to hand over to, to Nikki and her team um, or some of the other agencies around, for instance, using North Holt, Farnborough, um, Swank themselves um, yeah. to be able to get everybody geographically deconflicted, but also speaking to the right people at the same time. Yeah, so I guess for anybody who's not massively familiar with aviation, it'd be a little bit like having a bicycle being followed by a slow car being followed by a Porsche that wants to do 100 miles an hour. And those are all gradually catching each other up. And you've got to find a safe way of getting them to be seen where you want them to be seen and then splitting them up so that they don't come into conflict with each other. Is that sort of reasonable, do you think? Yeah, I think so. That's a, that's a good analogy. And, and, and that's the it's the way to do it if you if you use the same analogy if you're the pedestrian at the front of this um, and there's a bike chasing you down the easiest way is to step to the side which is exactly what the helicopters do is they just step out of the way and let the other faster aircraft um, continue so pretty much the faster aircraft go in a straight line and everyone else fans out um, around them and and no you said you were on on an aircraft on the day so tell me about that what were you doing on the day itself and where were you so uh, my normal aircraft is a typhoon single seat fighter um, and sometimes we've had uh, mission commanders who have been doing that job as well. Um, but this year we decided to uh, put the mission commander onto um, the P-8 and the P-8 is a um, called the Poseidon. Uh, it's a, based on the 737. It's our maritime patrol aircraft, which is based at RF Lossiemouth. Um, so their sort of day to day is 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 looking for uh, surface and subsurface vessels. Um, but they've also got a great suite of communication um, on the aircraft as well. And not only the number of radios I mentioned before, but also they've got um, a data link as well. So effectively, I could sit off um, over the North Sea as I did in this uh, scenario, rather than running through London myself. Uh, I sat off, um, in the North Sea and we could actually see the whole fly pass panning out, um, the rotary assets as they were uh, going to their main um, sort of run-in points and also the red arrows as they came in from the North Sea as well. And I could see all of that along with all of the other civil traffic that were being put out on our surveillance picture through the data link. So I could see 
um, all of uh, what was going on, as well as be on those four different frequencies. Um, so in the back of the aircraft, there's a number of different workstations, and I was using one of those workstations alongside um, some of the tactical directors of the actual aircraft itself, who were um, mainly involved in the navigation and the safety of the aircraft, whereas me, my focus was on the safety of the whole package and coordinating and monitoring what was going on. Thank you. Nikki, what about you on the day? What were you having to deal with on the day? Um, so I came in to work quite early on Saturday because, uh, funnily enough, I couldn't really sleep much on uh, Friday night. So <laughs> I came into work um, and we had the Met brief. And then after that, a few things needed to be um, sorted out that for the any weather contingencies that we were maybe going to have. So that took up most of my morning. The controllers then that we brought in on the day, there was around um, 20 controllers that came in. They all came in and we set up in where we were all going to be situated. Normally we have three sectors where we're all split out in the room. However, we put us all together so we were completely near to each other so we didn't have to walk around the room. And um, we got everyone set up. We set up all our consoles and then we basically just waited for everything to get airborne and, and waited for the weather options to be broadcast. I I was on an open line for about an hour and a half to two hours with the project officer in London, just passing weather information, passing information and answering any questions that were needed, really. And Rich, what about Nats and now we're all on the day then? What what happens with us and how do we how does something like a fly pass like this impact on normal operations and you know the the normal air traffic that we have day to day? Yeah, so so obviously it, it does have an impact. Um I think in terms of in terms of in terms of managing that, uh, it, it's all it's all predicated on the procedures that we've we have in place uh, to start with. Uh, I, th I thought you were going to ask me where I was on the day there, Fran, for a moment, but knowing, knowing that I wasn't actually at work on the day in spite of me, <laughs> I was available on the telephone in support of the duty watch, um, the duty operations supervisor on the day, but they were they, all the briefings had been carried out previously. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, impact to, to, to our operation really, uh, Funnily enough, it, it's it's it makes almost no difference whether it's one aircraft, twelve aircraft, or in this case the the helicopters and the Reds, or it would have been the full sixty eight aircraft. It's uh it's kind of like a a a, a stop or a an impact on on each airport on a, a, a period of time, you know, planned on when everything goes past. And I was thinking about that as Noel was talking about coordinating the various speeds, you know, at each end of our procedures at the start and the end. A lot of that is based on the, the speed of the aircraft and when we can resume operations if there was any pauses to certain airports operations. Um, we had uh, additional additional bodies in. Um, so we have someone, a, a sector that we call Thames. So those controllers look after London City Airport uh, and approach for Biggin Hill as well and South End are the three airports they look after, but they also um, operate what we call special VFR, special visual flight rules uh, for aircraft in and out of Battersea Airport ordinarily. And you see the pleasure flights down the Thames, our, our, our medical medical emergency helicopters, etc., over the centre of London. Uh, clearly, that's the airspace that the Flypass wanted to use um, during dur on Saturday afternoon. Um, so we have we had an extra one of those in liaison with uh, the military, sat through with 78 Squadron. And then we have a supervisor who monitors the uh, the airport approach functions for all the London London area airports. Uh, we had an extra one of those to help with the coordination aspect as well, and a liaison with our military colleagues and, and the various airports. Um, yeah, uh, as the fly pass runs runs through, it, it it comes it sort of broadly speaking ran through from northeast through to to southwest or west London, uh, uh, and and. Periodically, as we go, as it overflies certain areas, it has it has potential impacts on on different airports. Hmm. And how does SNAPS work with the airports and the airlines around something that's going to happen like this? How you know what do we do in preparation? Yeah, it's, it's, I think collaboration is the key word <laughs> with this, and, and and getting in in advance, you know, so that everyone's aware of of, of the potential impact and, what, and what's going to happen. Um, we are. Uh, so some of some of the airports are, are also also controlled by Nats. Some aren't, but we have really good working relationships with with all the London area airports, be they Biggin Hill and, and Battersea Heliport, or be it be that Heathrow and, and the Heathrow Airport Limited. Um, our Nats colleagues at, at Heathrow coordinate with Heathrow Airport Limited around you know managing managing the the arrivals and departures um, and, and the conversations with the airlines ar around that flight past. Brilliant. Um, what things were keeping you up at night last week? What was worrying you? <laughs> the weather. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I mean, so we've had, 
<laughs> I think that's going to be everybody's answer. But to be honest with you, so we've uh, having uh, yeah, we've 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 obviously had a number of events in recent years. You know, some celebratory uh, uh, and some some bit a bit more memorial. Um, but they and they've all they've all passed off well. But we've been fortunate with the RAF 100 fly past and the Platinum Jubilee that the weather was good and that we were able to execute a, a, a well a well drilled plan pretty much pretty much as as expected. Um, this this required the contingency element to be enacted on the day, both from from Noel's decision making process by the sounds of it as to what 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 could fly fly on the fly past, and and us coordinating with 78 Squadron in, in terms of safely getting the aircraft back to back to their home bases afterwards. Yeah, so Noel, tell me about that. What was keeping you up at night last week? What kind of contingencies did you need to plan for? What things did you need to make sure you had in your back pocket, as it were? Well, uh, um, the yeah, the weather the weather was definitely the one that was uh, preying on my mind. Um, but actually, the the sort of uh, pressure of the day and the pressure of that build up um, is something that we're quite used to doing in the military. This is large force employment of large numbers of aircraft with all different capabilities to try and achieve a common goal is is pretty much our day to day business. So um, that element of it, I wasn't uh, I wasn't too worried about. And actually, because we'd spent so long looking into those contingencies, going backwards and forwards with Nikki and her team about the egress, um, looking through all the finer detail of all the different contingencies that might occur, um, weather and also other factors. When we actually come to the day, um, you know, the, unfortunately, with all of that planning and all the coordination, all the things we can control, the one thing we can't control is the weather. So there was a little bit of, you know, it'll be what it will be, unfortunately, um, because, um, you know, I, I didn't want to sort of get too down about it. And actually, because we wanted the whole team uh, who were flying to sort of remain upbeat and remain on their game as well. Um, so even though we were looking at it thinking, you know, a warm front over London is definitely not what we want on the uh, on the day of the coronation. Um, you know, and I'm sure most of the public who are walking in London was also thinking exactly the same thing. But from a aviation perspective, um, everyone knows what that means and everyone knows that that means it's not going to be an ideal condition. So it was either going to, as I said, it was either going to be what it was in terms of a limited fly past or if we were going to do anything bigger, if the regulations allowed, then it was actually going to be pretty difficult uh, and therefore it was going to be challenging for those crews who are flying it um, to enact the egress plan that we'd come up with um, to make sure it, it remains on plan and safe. So I, I wasn't too uh, sort of um, twitchy the day before because I was quite confident that because of all the time and effort we spent in getting to that point on the day, that all the contingencies were covered off uh, and what we did on the day was one of those contingencies and therefore it wasn't um, uh, although it was a uh, the decision comes 45 minutes before um, the actual plan uh, was something that was all um, pretty much cleared up um, a couple of months before with the finer detail of um, the what ifs as we call it on the, on the day yeah. um, discussing with the various different parties um, of what would happen if we enacted this. Let's have a think about it in detail. That's exactly what we did on that morning. Nikki, do you think there was uh, more pressure involved in this fly past over the others? I know we, we spoke earlier and you've been involved in both the RAF 100 and the Diamond Jubilee ones before now. So you're pretty much a fly past veteran from that point of view. <laughs> <laughs> you're the woman with the knowledge. Was it different this time? Did you have to worry about anything differently or do things differently or was there more pressure? Um, I think for me, there wasn't any different pressure to the previous ones. There's a huge amount of pressure with everything you do with something like that. You know, for the Platinum Jubilee, you wanted it to be great for the Queen. And for this one, obviously, we wanted it to, to be amazing for the King. So I think the pressure remains the same. It's just, you know, like everyone said before, we can't control the weather. So unfortunately, on that day, it just happened to change what we would have been doing. But no, I think the pressure remains the same. Everyone wants it to be amazing and everyone wants to showcase what the what the fort military can do. Yeah, and I think everybody wants the spectacle on a day like that as well, don't mm, they? You know, with the public definitely. all want to see something amazing. So I know we all feel that we want something like that to happen and happen really well to, to be a credit to all of us. Um, tell me, Nicola, a little bit more about the relationship between Nats and the RAF with 78 Squadron in particular and how you find that working with us at Swanwick. So the military and um, Nats here at Swanwick, we have a quite joint and integrated relationship. You know, we have to have a close relationship to be able to um, have co cooperation with the air traffic services and a, a more flexible use of airspace. We 
we sit side by side to each other, you know, in the AC ops rooms, we're side by side with um, AC controllers and also in the TC ops room, we have our North Alt radar um, guys sitting next to Heathrow controllers. So, you know, we have to be able to work with each other and team cohesion is, is a major, major importance with our relationship with Nats. And I think, you know, we do do it well, like Rich said earlier, that part of our egress plans for, to, to get the aircraft home was to have civil controllers sitting next to our military controllers, allowing them to maybe book corridors and coordinate airspace that would be quicker if we had them sitting next to us. And, you know, it's amazing that we can go through and we can discuss with Rich and his team that can we have a couple of controllers to allow us to get out of the airspace quicker so that we can hand it back quicker. And, and I think things like that just show how well we do work together. Yeah, I'd, have to, I'd second that from a from a civil point of view. In a previous life, I was a controller in in AC area controllers. Nikki touches on there, so that's the the wider part of the of the UK airspace. Uh, and and now working in, it was always a, it was always a good relationship with uh, with military colleagues. Um, obviously, it, you know they're trying to 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 continue their their military function, defending defending our airspace, um, continual training, etc. And we're and we're running a civil air traffic operation, you know, in and out of multiple airports side by side so having having each of us sat in the same operations room is hugely beneficial in terms of being able to communicate and coordinate quicker but also also less than learn share our expertise with each other um yeah and it, and that's been replicated now that i work through in in the terminal control environment as well yeah and i completely agree as a controller in there it's 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 great to be able to just speak to you guys when we need to and find out what's going on and and find things out from you and you find things out from us and i think we just work so much better together it's a, it's a really positive thing i think to have you um in with us there so I, I really appreciate that so um so tell me rich what did it mean to you to be part of something as historic as this then this this is the first coronation we've had since 1953 um <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty certain that none of us were around for that one so um <laughs> i was gonna say it definitely wasn't definitely wasn't yeah uh, yeah there's a certain sense of pride in being being involved in in organizing and, and carrying that out i say I, I i was in this one i was organizing it uh, and for her majesty's um, funeral in september i was on duty coordinating the the sort of the stops and the airspace so there's there is definitely a, a sense of duty pride even even from a from a civil perspective um yeah in, in being able to to play your part in in this in this kind of event really and nikki what about you how does it make you feel Are you proud of what you did oh i was immensely proud yeah i know it didn't you know didn't go as planned but all the planning that we we did in in the run-up to it and what you know it just gives you an immense sense of pride that you were involved in that and I think for me personally because I had done a couple before and I was lucky enough last year to go and actually meet the king at Windsor Castle last November as part of my efforts on the um, Platinum Jubilee flypass it just meant a little bit more to me because I'd actually met him so yeah I was immensely proud. And Noah what about you a job well done but it makes you feel proud to be part of something like this something historic? Yeah definitely uh, it's it's you know a once in a once in a lifetime opportunity um and even though it didn't go exactly to plan on the day um you know we all needed to still be there still do our jobs no matter how uh large or small the fly past ends up being um but yeah it's a immense sense of pride because it's it's one of those things that you can sort of say i was involved in that um and you can remember for many years to come and and you know it was um yeah it was it was good to be part of something so big um and so special um and you know it didn't quite work out on the day but um but Celebi, um we still had we still had our jobs and um we still delivered a tri-service fly past um yeah. for his majesty uh, or their majesty so yeah very proud of what we achieved yeah i completely agree controlling on the day just it's one of those days you'll remember that you know you were there when that happened so that's brilliant thanks very much to everyone that's a, been a really interesting discussion we've had quite a lot of questions in as i'm sure you can imagine and um, so we'll try and get to some of those for you now uh, we had a question from billy that says how do we work with other organizations like the caa and the maa on these kinds of fly paths are there certain regulations that make these fly paths more complex than perhaps say an air show or something like that um, so maybe I'll come to you, Noel, first with that one. Yeah, so um, very similar to working with uh, NATS, uh, the CAA uh, and the MAA are, are in, in the planning very early on. So once we've, and although it's a well-trodden path in terms of fly past over London and the routing, um, effectively there's a level of scrutiny that's applied to operating within the uh, Thames Valley avoidance area for us. 
uh, that means that we have to submit effectively requests to do so, um, not only to the CAA and the MEA, but from a military perspective from our own command chain um, in the Ministry of Defence um, to approve us to do uh, to to fly the sort of activity in the first place. Um, I mean, air show regulation is relatively complex as it is, um, but for a fly past of this nature, we've got to adhere to the fly past regulations for the MAA, but also the low flying regulations, but also the rules of the air as well. So all of those different regulations have to sort of be adhered to. Um, and where we may need to ask for special dis dispensation for certain aspects of that regulation, that needs to be staffed all the way through into the MAA um, for them to approve um, each individual element where it might not meet the regulation um, in specifics. And then we sort of submit that and then we get questions back. Um, so it's all very tightly controlled, tightly regulated, but it is very early on that we sort of go through those processes um, and to say similar planning to an air show uh, in terms of trying to meet the regulations, but obviously quite a few more complexities in given the location where we are. Yeah. And Rich, would you echo that? Is there anything different that you can add to that? Uh, no, I think Noel's, Noel's, Noel's summed up nicely there. Obviously, Nats works, you know, very closely with the Civil Aviation Authority on 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 everything day to day, really, in terms of the way we carry out our operation. I think um, Noel was probably involved a lot more in terms of in terms of getting the permissions for for the fly past. I think from our point of view, there's, there's a number of other stakeholders like the Department for Transport, etc., as well. Uh, and obviously, there were a number of restricted areas, you know, in addition to existing controlled airspace in place. Um, and to enable the the aircraft, all, all the, the military aircraft, to to safely get through, through and over over the palace at the right time, and and obviously we've all sort of touched on how important and and complex the the exit strategy is from our airspace as well. Afterwards, that's really where our liaison with the the CAA and and DFT comes in. Uh, and we've had a question from Stephen that says, do the royal family put their own preference on which aircraft they want to see and how many they want to see? And I don't know who's best qualified to answer that one. I don't know. Nicky, did the, did the king give you any hints when you met him at Windsor last year? <laughs> no, he didn't. I did also meet Prince William, though, and he did say that um, the more helicopters, the better. So I think he was probably happy from Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> no, what about you? Do you know if, if the royal family put any preferences out there? So um, when we when we put it together and let's say that concept phase, that's the bit that goes to the royal household, um, i.e. this is what we're looking to present to you. Um, and and they sort of pass their feedback and and, and maybe ask to see more. Um, I did notice on um, Twitter that the Prince of Wales did acknowledge that the Rotary Ring were doing the heavy lifting, um, sort of uh, tipping his cap to his time as a Rotary Ring pilot in, in the Royal Air Force as well and also outside in air ambulance. So, um, so yeah, they do have an, a direct involvement. That's all done through our sort of defence links into the royal household. But yes, they do have a, um, a a final say effectively on what what they want to see. And actually, the fly past, the planned fly past, had various different um, links and connections with the uh, with the military. For instance, led by the um, the Junos, uh, which are from number one FTS, so Flying Training School, uh, which were both. Um, Prince William and Prince Harry both had gone through training as well. So there are little links in there to various different parts of the royal family's um, recent past um, that sort of come out in that concept phase, but they they get the final say at the end of the day. Oh, I'm sure they were pleased as well. So uh, we've had a question from Michael. Rich, one, this one might be for you. How <laughs> is Nats working together with neighbouring foreign air traffic control centres and units to absorb delays so that aircraft don't arrive as scheduled with significant holding times, especially given the higher traffic demand that we have in London airspace? I guess that's general <laughs> and with a fly past. <laughs> I was going to say that's, that sounds like someone's taking the opportunity to ask a, a wider question there, but that's that's absolutely fine because because uh, it does it did apply to how we manage the, the traffic around the fly past as well so yeah so we, we we work very closely is is the short answer with our with our neighboring uh, air navigation service providers um through uh for those who don't know through through a, a, I say a company an agency called Eurocontrol based in brussels who uh, centrally manage uh, any any sort of air traffic management measures that we need to put on and that's a, that's a coordinated collaborative approach across the whole of europe um which is is looked at uh, strategically and and tactically uh, and we we apply measures as necessary to 
to minimize air, air holding um, to safely manage air traffic. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of different factors that go into that, whether there's capacity constraints, whether there is uh, weather such as there was on Saturday impacting that, or of course, special events such as such as a fly past. Uh, and that doesn't change that all gets factored into the decision making process. Uh, and then we use our expertise and experience to uh, to 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 coordinate with the airports and, and manage traffic in such a way that the, the right number safely arrive in, into our airspace at, at the right time. And again, that's managed, isn't it, both sort of strategically and tactically. So a few days before we've been, you know, months before we'll be looking at it and the demand on the day, but a few days before there'll be demand will be checked and, um, you know, they'll be monitoring what requirements there are for the traffic and then on the day how that's looking and how that's working and even tactically then in terms of asking aircraft to, to slow down or manage their speed appropriately so that we can minimise the delay. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and and so so with regards to the fly past, um, there was a there was a, a a traffic plan in place that was enacted 24 hours out based on the, the fact that we knew that there would be a fly past or there would the ambition was that there would be a fly past happening at, at 230 local over the palace. Uh, and we had to manage the, the rest of the rest of the network accordingly in order to to provide the safest environment for that to happen. Brilliant. Uh, another one probably for Noel here, though maybe Nikki can chip in as well. Um, a question from Andy. I noticed that many of the aircraft were still positioned over East Anglia and the North Sea for an extended period after the scheduled fly past. Was this part of a planned scale down abort in the event of poor weather? So um, uh, the idea was to try and get the biggest fly past we could based on the options. So effectively we launched uh, the aircraft that could launch uh, were launched into the holds um, and then once the decision is made um, obviously the, the number one priority is to make sure that we safely uh, get the aircraft back to their home those aren't participating in the fly past uh, while making sure we keep out of the way of those aircraft that are so obviously the red arrows um, still needed to come through um, and they were down at a thousand feet and so the um, the envoy which was the aircraft um, in a similar hole to them, needed to obviously remain airborne and remain higher um, than the Red Arrows to allow them to come through. Um, as I said earlier, I, I was still airborne, so I still had a command and control function um, to make sure I was monitoring and coordinating any um, any other issues that might crop up in the fly past. So um, the Poseidon P8 moved closer to the um, to the to London within the airspace and just moved to a closer hold, um, so I could get line of sight. So we all had our own roles to play and for the rest of the aircraft then it was down to Swanwick and the different number of different controllers to effectively coordinate the reverse of what they've just done, i.e. Their, their departures from their own airfields now are to be safely deconflicted um, because now under the egress plan, which we plan in great detail, now effectively it's down to Swanwick to dynamically manage those in the holds uh, and to prioritise them correctly and, and and then sort of get them back to their home plate. Probably Nikki can probably cover a bit more about how that was actually managed. But yeah, so obviously we had all the aircraft um, over the North Sea and because of the weather and, and how, how bad it was, we couldn't just throw them all back at their home units, at, you know, just to get rid of them. And we also were still concentrating on the rotary wing and the red arrows in doing the actual fly past. So they were sequenced back into their home units. And then obviously some of them, like the heavies, had to come back through and get to Bry's. So they, they were out in the North Sea for a while, but they were gradually fed back into their home units and landed safely. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we've had a question from Stefan that says, why was such a large area of airspace needed for such an event? Um, <laughs> if the single word answer to that is obviously safety, but there'll be a lot more oh. adverts to that. If uh, Who wants to come on in that one? Maybe Rich, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I can, I can start with that one. Yeah, there was a number of restricted areas sort of subdivided by time with the with the aim of kind of uh, providing the, like you say, safety, providing the protection needed for the for the fly past, but also to stand down those areas as as soon as safely possible, conscious that there are other airspace users out there. Obviously, this is an event that we that you know, has high um, public interest, shall we say, and, and we're keen to keen to keen to make happen given the given the nature of the event. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, most of it boils down to the two largest areas, one out over the North Sea and East Anglia, 
as Noel's touched on already, is about is about getting all the aircraft airborne and in the holds and, and into the right place for the fly past in the first place. And obviously the contingency element, if unfortunately as it happened, not everything could could execute the plan. Uh, and then a relatively large area to the uh, the west and southwest of of the London area, which was all about the exit strategy. You know, in turn, we've already touched on it. Uh, there's you know aircraft of differing speeds um, and that concertina effect that Noel Noel described earlier. You get to everything. Everything was designed to to look as look as uh, exciting and 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 dynamic as possible over the palace. Uh, but then on the other side of that, you've then got to get 90 knot aircraft um, out of the way because there's 300 knot jets behind it. So the, the the wide chunk of airspace to the west and southwest was to allow different aircraft types to to exit the airspace via different different safe safe directions. And that 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 sums that up, I think, from from a civil perspective. I'm quite happy for <laughs> Nikki and Noel to to add anything that they have to that. From the um, from the military perspective in the North Sea, we had just under 50 aircraft, I think it was, uh, positioned in that area. And um, although uh, once they get on track, they will concertina together, as I described earlier. Actually, when they're holding, they're all separated um, because they need the freedom to go up and down in height, um, a to uh, manage their fuel accordingly to make the fly pass work, uh, but also the sort of lateral freedom to be able to manage their time as well. Because once they leave their holds, they need to be on time um, to effectively get to our first sort of time reference point, uh, which was just off the coast um, of Suffolk. Um, so everyone needs to be on time because that's where the start of the, the concertina starts to occur is at that point. So I'm sort of fanning in from quite a wide sort of um, wide area in the North Sea, all coming together and just making sure that everyone sort of fits in at their right point. So to do that, you just need a little bit of lateral space and also vertical to give us that flexibility to do it, which is no different to what we sort of would do for a normal sort of large force employment, either exercise or for real. There'd be a large bit of airspace where everyone would be marshalling before everyone goes down and, and sort of gets funneled in and then fans out again. And uh, a question came in from Andy saying that the Red Arrows seemed to abandon their promulgated fly past route fairly quickly after the overhead uh, and ended up so southwest of Reading. Um, was that premeditated? Did it require short notice ATC facilitation? And was this as a result of sketchy weather encountered? So if I start off from uh, what... <laughs> what the Red Arrows are actually doing and then we can talk about the um, air traffic implications. So and um, we discussed previously and that morning um, that with that warm front coming in over London, that typically brings in low cloud precipitation um, and therefore it was deteriorate. The weather was deteriorating to the west. So even though it was fit for the limited fly pass that we um, we uh, managed to achieve on Saturday, we knew that the weather towards the west was deteriorating and we knew that um, from the observations that he threw, for instance, that the, the cloud was lower. So um, the Red Arrows uh, went over the uh, palace um, at their designated height and tried to maintain that height uh, to continue their fly past, although initially um, it seemed that they were going to be able to do that. Uh, and stay within the sort of visual flight rules um, as the weather deteriorated to the west and they had to enact one of their contingencies which was effectively to um, abort their visual flight and then go to instrument flight um, and so effectively uh, that is where the aircraft are now no longer visual with the ground they're going to accept that they need to go into cloud and therefore they um, climb themselves up to above safety altitude, so the minimum height that you can be assured that there are no obstacles underneath um, that you can't obviously see now you're in cloud. And then that was um, for the job for air traffic to now coordinate uh, their onward route. And Nikki, I know that's something you were doing on the day. I remember you seeing you. So so that happened that um, the Red Arrows then needed to, to take that action. And so you came and spoke, didn't you? And we coordinated from there. Yeah, so it's quite um, dynamic and tactical con controlling and coordination. But as we said earlier, it's lucky that we are quite near to each other and we had um, someone from TC in with us that we could get that coordination coordination in as quick as we could to allow the Red Arrows to land safely at Bryce Norton. Yeah. yeah, and I think from a civil perspective, I can only second what Noel and Nicky have already said there, really. You know, that's that's why we had the continu contingency planning. That's why we had those sleepless nights on the on the run up you know with the potential weather forecasts and that's why we have the 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 coordination capabilities you know we had the extra the extra extra bodies from a civil perspective sat next to our military colleagues so that we were able to safely enact whatever the the airborne you know assets the airborne aircraft needed to do 
Uh, and I know that uh, obviously they, they, the the red arrows in particular had a had a number of choices, you know, in terms of in terms of where they might go, um, which which changed based on on the weather conditions at the airports. And we just manage all that tactically, which is what we do day to day in air traffic. That's ex how it goes. Ex exactly, and it's an example of Definitely. what we do do all the time. It's it would be no different to uh, an aircraft emergency or or some other such situation, which we're not planning for, but we're we're trained for and those procedures for and and all that training and and you know the coordination just kicks in really. And pays off. I think we've got time for one final question. Uh, it says it's not fly pass related. Um, I think probably for you again, Rich, was there a restriction on flying around Heathrow put in place for the Sunday night concert at Windsor with the drone light show in place? OK, yeah. So so in the so in the strictest sense of the question, yes, there was a restriction of flying. But um, uh, in, in terms of the, there was a protected zone o over Windsor Castle and, and the concert area, but um, it, they actually flow. Uh, a spectacular display but they actually they actually fly relatively low um so there was no impact on on the air, civil air traffic operations at any airport in, in that sense if there's certainly no no impact at Heathrow uh in much the same way that in the last couple of years we've seen drones on on displaying a new year's eve um down the thames uh london city is is shut at that time but again there'd be there'd be no other no other aid impact to civil aviation that's brilliant thank you very much um, I'm really sorry that that's all we've got time for this afternoon. I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all your questions today, but thanks for submitting them. Um, thanks again to all the panel, to Nikki and to Rich and to Noel for giving us their insight into the different elements of Saturday's celebration and maybe that little bit the behind the scenes that's a little bit less well known. Um, as there always is, an on-demand version of this show will be available shortly after the uh, recording is finished today and an audio only version will also be available in all the usual places that you can get your podcast from. Keep an eye on Nat's social media channels for updates on this and the next set episode of Altitude. Thank you all very much for watching and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.